between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, diversify and create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. Go to rise25.com, learn more. It's run by myself, co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. I'm very excited. Today, it's been a long time coming. We have Jay Lagarde who founded Ecom Engine back in 2006. They have a suite of software products used by Amazon sellers to increase revenue and get more reviews, which Obviously, all Amazon sellers want. They have feedback automation tool called Feedback 5, which we're going to talk about, an inventory management tool called Restock Pro, and a product research tool called Ecom Spy. And they were the first feedback management tool on Amazon. And because of that, they have a lot of large sellers that use the tools. And a fun fact about Jay is... Way back when, he created the first comprehensive website in the world that automated the regulatory process. So his technical roots go way back. Jay, thanks for joining me. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Glad to be here and look forward to chatting with you. You know, I'm excited because you have some uh, some really cool tools that help Amazon sellers, um, but it didn't always start as a software as a service. So I want you to talk about the the beginning part of what now is Ecom Engine? Right. That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, at the time when Ecom Engine was started, um, we, we had no idea that it was going to be a company like it is today. It was really kind of a, I would say an ad hoc company. Um, I, I just started getting, uh, 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 request to help a friend. Um, my friend that's selling on Amazon or, or a client of mine is selling on Amazon. You're a technology guy. They have a problem I think you can talk with. Could you hop on the phone and talk to them? And after doing that for you know a month or so and having a lot of chats with people and saying, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. You need to think like this. And and then they said, well, could you do that for me? And I said, well, you What know, were some maybe of the things I'd- they wanted at the time? Do you remember? Yeah, it was really a lot of it was automation. A lot of times, you know, back in, you know, 2006, 2007, um, people were just, you know, getting into this game um, and they had automation aches and pains. Um, They had more um, uh, sometimes they had unexpected success and they realized that in order to scale, uh, they were going to need to automate, Uh, you know, a favorite favorite story of mine uh, from early on was a was a, uh, a couple. Had, they had a specialty in a certain domain. I won't say what it is, but I'd say this is probably 2006, maybe 2007. They had a specialty in a certain domain. They knew all about it. And they decided they were going to you know, just throw up a few things on Amazon. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, it really um, started taking off. And they started selling stuff. And you know, before you know it, uh, uh, this uh, lady had her, her, her garage was full. She was shipping stuff every day. And, and she was... They were excited. I mean, she maybe had 40 or 50 things she was shipping every day, but she was also getting very stressed. And somehow somebody said, you need to, t-, you know, this, uh, somebody put me together to have a long chat with her one day. And I had several chats with her. We went on and on. She had these problems. She was going to the post office every day and, and she had all these things to ship and she really wanted to scale her business. She was very, very, frankly, she was stressed. I mean, she had so many things going on and, and I said, look, you know, you need to automate this. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is, of course, this is just one-on-one automation for, for all of our users here, but, and, uh, you know, you need to get, you need to get an order management system. You need to get Indicia. You need to get, you know, a label printer. And I gave her a list and I said, I- I'm not going to charge you anything. I said, you go do this first and then come back and talk to me. And then I'll tell you how, you know, if you need any custom work for me, but you need to get the basics first. Yeah. And what, what she told me in response just floored me. And I remember to this day, she says, I don't have time to do all that. You don't realize I have to go, I have to spend every day. I've got hours I need to spend in the post office. 
And, and she was very earnest and I was very earnest right back. I said, you don't have time, you know, you don't have the ability not to do this. Right. I said, you don't realize you need to invest, you know, several, tw 10, 20, 30 hours of your time to buy this equipment and to learn how to use it because you don't have, they'll you, free up you that have no amount choice per not week to. for her. And yeah. what I thought was obvious was not obvious to her. And that was just something I remember very distinctly, very early on. Uh, uh, but to answer your question about, about what did we automate? Um, well, stick with that person for a second. So yeah. then you recommended in Disha. You what? What were you recommending at the time? What, what software was around? Or you know, this was just it was very ad hoc. You know, so I, you can't say this is what I recommended. I mean, I listened to what she needed. She needed a label printer. I told her to go buy a Zebra label printer yeah. and get labels and buy Indicia and get, at the time, Stone Edge was a big order manager. Yeah. What would you recommend today if you were to talk to that lady right now? Well, I'd have to mention a competitor if I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> a <laughs> no, competitor uh, of yours? You no, know, maybe ShipStation or something like that for something yeah. as simple as what she needed. Yeah. They could probably do everything she needed. It would capture orders and print labels. Um, of course, you know, inventory management and stuff gets layered on top of that, but... Um, her, her, her immediate low hanging fruit needs were to, you know, save three hours of her day every right. day. <laughs> Cause I'm sure someone listening to this right now, there's someone listening to it who's probably experiencing that, that that lady is experiencing that well, now. Have, it, so it's a little harder to experience exactly that problem now, just because the technology is more ubiquitous to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But it is possible, yeah. Um, and and it is possible. And so, from a person that comes, and from a company that comes from the point of view of automation, um, it's really surprising that there are still opportunities for automation. But it, but it only takes a, a few conversations with a few customers to realize, you know, there are opportunities for automation. Yeah. And if you're going to compete, if you're going to compete in this, you know, Amazon level playing field. Um, it means you're going to be competing yeah. against people that are much, much bigger than you. And yeah. you know, all, our whole passion from day one has been really to to help small entrepreneurs uh, and to let them really own their own business, own their own lives. And, and you know, the whole idea of Ecom Engine was to sort of uh, enable that, enable that possibility for folks and kind of bring, bring a more of a, a big, big company software tool set and make it available to to a smaller entrepreneurial seller yeah. that's trying to you know carve out a business for themselves what did you end up doing did you end up doing some <coughs> custom software for her or what did you end up doing i spoke with her two or three times and we had a very cordial conversation i i would like to hope she she believed me at some point but i on that last call i was not sure that i had convinced her um, she was very, very skeptical that it was worth investing a few thousand dollars in this software and equipment. And what were you recommending at the time for her? Um, I, I think this is going back a long time, so yeah. I'm, I'm kind of guessing. I'm sure it was Indicia. I'm sure it was a label printer, and I'm sure it was something. I mean, like from that. you though, like, what were you? Because you were going to do a custom project for her, right? Nope. Oh, I, you weren't. No, I, I got at that time. It was. Every fourth person I talked to, did I think that it was worthy of pitching something to them? A lot of times, it was hearing them out, and I, you know, I was understanding what their needs were, and I was right. saying, "Well, you don't need me right now." It you didn't know, fit what you I did. think what you need to think about is this. And some people right. say, "Well, I can do this for you, but it's going to cost you." You know, for me to solve this problem for you is going to cost you this much, and it may have sounded like it wasn't a lot to us because we had to pay salaries and everything to make it work, but. Sounded like a lot to them. Is that you may not need that right now. Here's a lower level thing you can do. Come back to me. And frankly, that was part of what drove us to be more of a platform um, based model because we recognize that the, the custom thing, as fun as it was to solve someone's problems, we were very limited in what we could do. And a lot of people didn't have the budget. And also, we also saw scenarios where where you would talk to someone and they had had a really good six months or even a really good year on Amazon and they were just flying high and thinking this was the, you know, they were ready for retirement. The gravy train. And you talk to them and you realize, you know, I really hope you will be there, but you under, but they didn't really understand the risk in the market that, that I think we saw. We realized that, you know, next year you're not going to be able to do the same thing that you did, you know, last year. We're great. You had success. So, yeah, I could give them a, a, a big – a big bill and say, I can build you this stuff and for whatever. Um, but I, I also had that little doubt that, that they were betting on, on as much success or growth and success, um, the next year that they had the year before. And, and, 
and you know sometimes I wanted to pe- to preach caution. Um, yeah, we had we had a really great customer, um, really wonderful uh, family. Had a great store, and they were actually you know featured by Amazon. Uh, hmm. They were Amazon sent a, a video crew out to their place, and we were doing work for them and. And, um, and towards the end of the project, they kept asking us to do more work and they asked us to keep delay getting paid and, you know, started making us anxious what was going on. And, and, uh, you know, a few months later, uh, they had all this inventory and their sales had dwindled down and, and they had, you know, had to file and we didn't ever got paid, wow. <laughs> you know, what type but of product they had, but really? yet they had, had great success. And so that's mm-hmm. not to, that's not to discourage anyone. Um, but that is to kind of. Second, the the, the why thing, did it dwindle? Do you think? Oh, uh, competition. Oh. Uh, these guys were selling toys, and they had gotten in early uh, before toys were hot, and toys were then just becoming hot. And what was easy one year became much more competitive, and so the the game became much more complex hmm. um, to get the right inventory mix uh, and so forth. So, were you doing a bunch of just larger custom projects for them, or? We actually were doing a web store for them. Mm. We were automating their backend system. We were creating an Amazon web store, a custom yeah. Amazon web store that was highly customized for their individual catalog, yeah. doing some custom catalog work for them. Yeah. So, Jay, you see this across a lot of sellers, right? Because you these are your customers. What are the big mistakes you see people are making uh, on Amazon? You know, I... I I don't know that there's any one big mistake. I, I just, and frankly, I don't have as much one-on-one with customers as I used to have. Um, but, but I would say, you know, you need to be, you need to be very positive. You need to be entrepreneurial. You need to look at different marketplaces. Amazon, of course, is where the growth is. I'm not, I'm not kidding. You know, I'm not kidding anybody there. You think people should diversify more? A little bit, but not. They can even diversify on Amazon. In other words, they need to think. They need to think. Let's optimize what I'm doing today. Um, yeah, this is working. Let's try to do it a little better. <laughs> uh, because if it's working easily, by all means, get profit where you are. But you also need to think about what's the next game. Um, you know, what's the next product? Uh, because yeah. because there's no guarantee that what you're doing today is gonna is gonna work tomorrow. Yeah, I want you to talk a little bit about the transition from. You know, we were talking before. It's it's it seems obvious now, and but it's hard. The transition from you're kind of doing the consulting and bigger projects at maybe ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and I think you said to me one time, you know, that doesn't get you a lot of software, even for that price point. Um, no, not and, of his pure custom. No. Yeah, and then wanting to support small sellers. Talk about <coughs> the the difficulty of that transition mentally and then actually having to to do it because then you have to turn away business that are bigger projects too yeah really really the most we would have become a more of a SaaS company early on we would have you know done feedback five and other things more rapidly but but we had customers that we had become friends with over the years and then friends of friends kind of a thing and and it's it's very hard when you're a custom person and you really enjoy getting into a deep dive conversation with a smart Amazon seller about their problem, whatever it may be. And and, and we really enjoyed solving those problems and solving it, you know, theoretically or on paper and writing it down and saying it, it, it's fun. But but we ended up realizing that number one, you don't get all those jobs because the sticker sometimes the, the, the sticker cost sometimes comes out. Yeah. Bigger than what's than the largest than, largest proposal you put out? Largest dollar amount at the time? Well, our biggest job. Not saying um, you got it, but that's just realistically what you would have charged for a partner. Well, a big job for us would have been a hundred grand, and mm-hmm. we didn't get it. we didn't do it because it wasn't really our our thing. That would be a very large job for us. Yeah. A small job would be five grand and everywhere in between. Yeah. Um, two grand for a very small job, five grand. So there was, these are little, little jobs. Um, so, but our biggest job, it wasn't so much a quote, but we, we were, um, we were actually doing some web store work at the time. We were, we were very closely partnered with Amazon and Amazon was actually sending us some, some clients, um, to do web store work. And one of the clients, uh, uh, they, they sent us uh, kind of indirectly was a large company that had come to them and said, we want to create a, an Amazon web store experience. We want to do, we want to put all this on an Amazon web store. And it would happen to be a very large, um, multinational, uh, company. Um, and, um, 
And so they came to us and, and it was kind of just humorous that they would contact us for this because we're just, you know, guys in a garage almost. And, um, and so we ended up working with them. Um, you know, it's Lockheed Martin. I don't think it's any, anything. It's just a, a you know large company that does a lot of government contracting and, and whatnot. And they were trying to create a the Amazon Web Store experience for a, for a very uh, antiquated uh, sales process that they were shooting for a big government contract. And so and so we we really worked hard for them for maybe six months. We developed all these prototype designs and all that. Unfortunately, they couldn't do what they wanted to do on the Amazon Web Store. They just the technology wasn't there. But they, but we did prototype designs about how they could accomplish the things that they wanted to do, how they could map their catalog into an effective storefront design and all that. They and they just they loved it. And it's like we thought, well. Anybody in e-commerce can do this stuff, but they, they just ate it up, you know, and so they, they use this stuff and, and they, they claim that, and, you know, that's kind of an hourly billing type thing. If you ever talk to somebody that does government contracting, it's, you know, you, you, you bill your hours and you get paid and you, you go home and whatever. So we were working with lots of other contractors, uh, all of them hugely bigger than us, um, on this project and, and they, so they, so they, they submitted in for this you know, billion dollar contract or whatever it was. And then a few months later, six months, well, it was more than a few months. It was, it was almost a year later. They came back to us and said, we got the contract. Now we want to do some real work with you. <laughs> and they, and I said, oh, really? <laughs> uh, cautiously. And, uh, and, and they also sent about a thousand pages of paper uh, to us. Like, Please read this and fill it out and sign it. <laughs> whatever. Well, why? Just as a contract? It's just, you know, all kinds of security things and blah, right. blah, blah. I, I, I couldn't read it all, um, needless to say. But also polling the staff uh, that we had, you know, nobody wanted to do this. Really? And it's not that they didn't want to, you know, serve our country and involve, but but it wasn't really exciting to them. It wasn't really our passion. Um, for me, it was really tough because it was real money and yeah. it was guaranteed money um, that, you know, paid for by. Why were you people. cautious at the time? Cautious about what? You said uh, you were kind of caught, like when you heard that, you were like, you weren't overjoyed or excited about oh, it. Oh, no, I was overjoyed. Oh, you were, okay. I, I, I was p very pleased to hear that they got it. I was pleased that they wanted to offer us the job. I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it I because you. I wasn't sure that was really our cup of tea. Yeah. I wasn't sure this was our yeah. real passion. It's a big In fact, crossroads. I'm sure that several of us were not passionate about it. I was kind of in the middle. Um, but there are a lot of folks that just, you know, they could do it, but at the end of the day, you bill your hours, but are you really feel like you're really making a difference? And, um, and we didn't really feel like we were making a difference mm. because we could be at the table and you're dealing with three or four other major subcontractors that all have people at the table and you can say the same thing three or four times, but at the end of the day, you're, all, you're, you're the last person that's on the pecking order. And so a lot of times there was a lot of rework. You'd do something, and then you'd realize, oh, we didn't give you the latest. You spec. don't have you don't, control. You don't have security clearance yeah. for that, but maybe we could tell you just this. And there's all these kind of things. And, and so you just didn't feel like you could really deliver that value. We wanted to go out there and build something great, and it was, we didn't have the control. That's exactly right. You, you said it exactly right. Yeah. So this would have been a huge contract. So what do you tell them? What did you, you end up doing? Uh, well, we said, really, we're flattered, and this is great, and we really appreciate it, but we, after we, we had some meetings on this, and I said, look, I said, if we turn this down, we need to work really hard and make our, our platforms really grow and make them work and, and productive, and everybody said, yes, that's, that's what we want to do, so we turned them down, we said, look, you know, we, we've loved working with you, and you know, I'm sure you'll find somebody else that can deliver the same value to you. We really appreciate it, and but we're we're going to have to say no. And they, yeah. they they came back a few more times, and but we, you know, they realized it just wasn't the right fit for yeah. us. And frankly, we would have had to put our best people on that project. Um, so you put your best people on a project like that, and then you know they're not there to 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 work on the the core stuff yeah. back at home. So that's a tough we decision. To, we decided to invest instead of uh, instead of taking that that. And the same thing had happened even after that. We had many great requests from yeah. previous customers. Will you do this customer – small request. Will you do this customer report? Will you do this thing? Will you do this one integration for me? And we, we kept saying yes a lot, but I would say in the last year or two, we, we pretty much avoid uh, doing anything like that unless it's really closely connected with, with our core products that we're yeah. building. That's a tough – that's a crossroads. 
You know, you almost get like, it's not your dream client, but it's like contract wise for a company to get a client like that. It's, it's huge. And then to realize this is not what we want to be doing. Um, and at the time SAS was not like it is now, right? Talk about the uncertainty around the business model in general. Well, you know, it wasn't as ubiquitous of a term as it is now. Everybody knows the word SaaS. Every every so- I mean, you pretty much say SaaS software, and and that to the now it's just software. You know, everything is SaaS, uh, or nearly everything. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't that, that hasn't been that long, um, and um, for a while it it was pretty clear to us that that's where things were going. Um, we knew it, but you know, SaaS has a has a has a risk associated with it. There's a lot of upfront investment. Um, you don't get paid for all that upfront investment right. costs. So that's a that's yeah. SaaS that's SaaS business yeah. model 101. That's yeah. lean. I mean, startup. you're charging thirty, forty, fifty thousand, and then you're like, wait, we're building this whole platform. We're not getting paid, and it's fifty dollars a month. You know, there's a big difference. There. Well, or, or it's nine dollars a month. And, right. <laughs> and you'll have some people for the very same product. They will tell you. You talk to two people in the same day, and one person will say, "I can't believe you are charging so much for this thing." Can't you give it to me for half price? And you say, you know, I'd love to give it to you for half price, but I, but you know, this is just our price, and I can't do it. And and they're very upset. They really want the tool, but they don't want to pay nine dollars a month. And then you'll talk to somebody else and said, I can't believe you're offering this for nine dollars a month. I would pay a hundred dollars a month for this tool. This is just delivering so much value to me. <laughs> and right. so, and so that's you know just an example of the SaaS pricing model. Some people can't afford it, but want it. Other people yeah. would be happy to pay a lot more. So it sounds like Jay, you kind of went to the team, and you kind of collectively said, "This we want to have a bigger mission. We want to have a bigger purpose, and we can't keep serving these clients for these." special jobs we want to build our own platform is that that's right is that how it went that's exactly right and we really felt in addition to that we really felt that that was really the way we could deliver the most value the market was growing there are more and more needs and we realized that that you know we were a drop in the bucket and if we wanted to really really deliver value into the market and help as many people as possible the way to do it was to have a platform with standardized software that would work for a lot of people yeah i mean i talked to these your name came up this week a lot because of this this is a struggle for a lot of people to turn down a contract like that like that lands on your lap and you need to make a decision whether you go from the one-to-one work that is really really high paying to a one-to-many that there's more uncertainty and you don't get paid as much um And, and you, yeah. you know you can build it, but you don't know they will come. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but it was interesting how you went about it. You got the, the acceptance of the team. So you guys were all on board to, go in this, to move in this direction. It wasn't Absolutely. you kind of standing on a, a pedestal saying, we're moving this direction. It sounded like it was a, sort of a collective um, yeah, there there was uh, buy. There there was a desire to see where's our where's our passion, where's our energy. Um, I mean, that's yeah. that, that, that's yeah. the way for us. That's the way our team has been yeah. built. And we just, the end, we it's a be- risk for you though, because you know if you're paying the bills and you're building this platform, you're taking a big risk. Absolutely, yeah, and and that's that's was very tangible. Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, and so, how do you decide what the first product is? So you know, at this point okay, we're not doing as much of the big contracts. We're going to shift to our own platform. Right. Now you have to decide on what that, what you're going to, what the product yeah, is. It wasn't quite that linear, but, right. but the point's well taken. Uh, and so, I mean, I think that Feedback 5 was still, you know, we had already decided on Feedback 5. You had. I think so. Yeah, Just because of, and I think it's valuable because you were probably talking to all these people one-on-one, finding what their pain points are. And was that like a common pain point? Is that why you decided to oh, go with yeah. Feedback 5? Before Feedback 5 was started, we had a number of, of, I would say, non-sassified platforms. They were multi-tenanted, but they weren't automated such that you could just sign off on the street. We had Smart Price. We had... We had a we didn't call it feedback five at the time. We just called it our feedback solicitation tool. Um, we had an integration platform where we would you know integrate different things in the cloud, you know connect different orders and, and suppliers and things like that. And so um, so uh, 
Yeah. So we just, we just, I mean, I, you know, just to be bluntly honest, I mean, we, I can remember we had a meeting, um, of several of us, um, uh, where we decided that, you know, we were going to, we were going to build a platform that people could just come in and sign up, which, which tool are we going to pick to do that? With? Right. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to invest some You're time. You're not going to say you brought like a dart board and you just threw a dart at it or something. Well, it, 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 it wasn't that <laughs> far from that. I, I mean, I'm going to be totally honest. I mean, we had a couple of, a couple of things on the docket and we just said, well, what do you think? Should we do this or should we do this? Should we do this? And we said, well, we, we think this would be the one that would be, you know, um, you know, the quickest to, to get up and running. And The and feedback one. That's what we thought at the yeah. time. I think in retrospect, it, it proved to be, um, you know, like anything, there's always more to it than you, you first envision when you're starting to, to do things. But, right. but, but yeah, that's exactly right. We, we said, we're going to pick one as a test and let's see what happens. Yeah. And 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 that's pretty much the way the way it was picked. I'd like to tell you that we did um, very statistical and careful market studies and and all. Well, that. you did in a sense of talking to people one on one. I mean, we absolutely talked to people, yeah. and we got and everybody was saying it. It was like really cool. <laughs> people loved it because we did have a platform that did that. Now, of course, we totally rebuilt it from the ground up to to do what we did. But we had a platform that was already do that. We may have had you know, a dozen people using it. I, I don't know, but it was, uh, wasn't a huge number, but they all gave us great feedback. They loved it. It was helping them out. And that gave us, you know, confidence, but, but it really, uh, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to sell it to a hundred people. Right. It means you, you think you can, but you got to test it. You, are people really going to pay? You don't know till it happens. And of course we didn't know the word marketing at the time. We were just, you know, geeks, uh, engineer types. And, you know, we just, we just didn't know. I mean, we, we knew the word marketing, but we didn't know a thing about that. You have to actually not just yeah. build something. You have to be able to tell people about it. Um, we were much, you know, there's this, um, what's that? A company, a Palantir, I think is the, uh, Palo Alto, the company out in California, they claim they have no marketers, you know, they, all they have is engineers. And we really were a bit like that. We just, you know, we just didn't think about marketing. We just felt we'd have a website and people would come. So, um, so yeah. And another early on in feedback five, before it had really taken off, um, another little validation that we had gotten and, and frankly, really, really surprised me and, and was also very gratifying and encouraging is that we we had done this tool. We had a small critical mass of customers that were doing it, that were giving us feedback. And we said, you know, we need to, we need to go out and actually talk to people and hear what they think about our tool. Let's, let's, let's be really bold. At the time, you know, we thought this was really bold. We're going to actually go ask them if they would be willing to, to, to write a blurb or a testimonial about, about our tool. And we just thought maybe a few people will write back and, and we'll be thrilled. Well, it blew me away the number of people that wrote back, and and also it blew me away what they said. Yeah, what was some of the feedback you were getting that well, was valuable? Well, I think first of all, the amount the people that were generous enough to write back to us was surprising to us. They were generous. They had to take their time to spend five minutes or ten minutes or whatever it was to write something. That in and of itself was surprising, gratifying, and surprising. And secondly, what they said. Um, was was more positive than us non marketers would have said ourselves had we been asked to pitch the product. So they were saying things that were the way it was helping their business and what they loved about it, how it was designed, and what it did for them. That were things that we were hopeful it was doing this, but we would have felt it was pushing the envelope if we would have written all these things ourselves. Right. So it was very gratifying to hear that because that really was motivational. Yeah, this really is helping people. <laughs> you know, we knew it, but it was nice to hear it. And it was also, of course, you know, part of the business of this is to hear, you know, not only what's the value we're delivering, but what can we do more and what can we do better? That's the question I have because obviously <laughs> the product itself, I'm sure, has changed from the beginning till now. So, sure. and you listen to your customers, what are some things that you've realized there's a pain point in your, with the customers or, and this, you know, if we're talking about feedback five, it's obviously around reviews and communication and feedback. Um, what has changed in the product over the years? Right. Well, the product has had a lot, a lot of iterations. Um, we, we had a funny little internal thing. We did like a way back machine with feedback five, you know, the first website, the right. different of it but you know it you know one small thing is, is that you know when we first started feedback five 
there was no Amazon messaging system like it was today. You actually got the customer's email address. So most people coming into Amazon right now, that just blows them away to even think that Amazon would give you the email address. Right. But yet we had everybody's email address. Yeah. And so our job, it was a very different part of the game there was deliverability. So you had to figure You're out. You're an autoresponder now. I yeah. Mean. So, so we had to learn all about deliverability metrics. And we had to become mini experts on getting emails delivered. And we were pretty good at it. But it wasn't easy because we were sending from everybody's own domain. So we had to do deliverability for all of these domains out there. Not just one domain to optimize on, but hundreds plus yeah. domains or thousands, really. <laughs> and so, so that was a that was something we had to become an expert on. That problem went. I mean, on the one hand, so we that was were better for you when the Amazon implemented it, this. We were concerned thing. about it, but right. on the one hand, it made that it made that deliverability problem go away because right. it, Amazon took took that up. So you know something about email, so you understand what I'm what I'm talking about. Yeah. There. But really, the the tool has become increasingly, you know, uh, able to deal with higher volumes. You know, uh, you know, we, we've got some very, very large customers being able to scale and be able to manage um, very, very reliably. You know, every time we say we're sending it and we're going to send it at a certain time, it sends at that time. So we very much have yeah. optimized it for over time. We've optimized it for kind of enterprise grade reliability. Um, yeah. So it works for very small sellers, but it works for very huge sellers as well. Yeah. So that's something nobody sees. It's just in the back end, um, but it's an important component of the tool. Yeah. Um, on the front end, you know, it's just gone through lots of iterations, different front end technology. Um, you know, but I'll just mention two things that I think have been have been really important. Um, initially, we had a very simple um, campaign structure. We had first email, second email, <laughs> and FBA versus non FBA. That's what we had. Of course, F FBA wasn't really around. We added that FBA component. Right. So it was a very simple campaign structure. Um, it was very powerful, and many people still do very simple stuff like that. But with the rise of private labeling um, on the Amazon marketplace, um, there became more of a need to do more custom sending of emails. And so we, we added a, a campaign management structure to it, mm -hmm. which pretty much allowed for unlimited customizations um, of timing, of message, of all that sort of thing. So that was one one change. Um, and another change, you know, recently is that we've we've really been focusing on on not just feedback management, feedback solicitation, feedback monitoring, feedback management, but we're now doing the same thing for product reviews. Um, and so yeah. we are we're able to monitor product reviews. We're able to capture product reviews. We're now starting product review analytics um, on our platform. So how does that work? Like um, I think, I mean, I use full disclosure. I use feedback five. I love it actually. And, um, you know, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, the product reviews, but if there's a neutral or negative re review, you get a text message so that you can address it. Is that one thing you're talking about or is that you completely can. separate? Okay. You, have, you absolutely can. Yeah. So, so let's say that you, that you've, you know, developed a brand for yourself and you want to watch those reviews and, you, you may or may not have the authority, you probably don't, but you could, to actually go in and respond officially on Vendor Central or whatever. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, you, you probably don't. So what you, but what you can do is that you can, you can find out what's going on, number one. You know, you do have the ability to reach out to that customer, try to resolve their concerns. You can't really arm twist them at all to change the review, but, but if, if you correct an error, yeah. um, then, you know, they're... You know, you can change that review. You can also respond to the review. You can get on there and write a response and try to set the record straight. Yeah, you, know, you have to exercise judgment and caution and all those matters. So, yeah. so monitoring product reviews in order to monitor what's going on on the platform is important. But you're also getting a feedback loop about your product. Um, and obviously, you want only good reviews um, <laughs> would be great. But let's say the most recent batch of products that you got from your manufacturer has a glitch or there's a problem in packaging or something. You missed it, or maybe it was hidden. Um, you're gonna find, you know, you you may find out about something. So not only do you want to watch the reviews, but you want to be able to observe patterns. Yeah. So you've had good good reviews for six months, and then the next batch starts, next manufacturing batch starts it, and then you see something changed. Well, you want to you want to know that and, uh, and and observe it. And of course, you also learn about your own product reviews. How do I iterate my product? How do I improve it? What are yeah. the pain points that people are getting? What's what's version 2.0? 
you learn that from product reviews. Yeah. Another piece of product reviews is you want to not only, you know, depending on your niche, your area, whatever, you not only want to know what's happening for your product reviews, you may want to watch what's happening for competitor product reviews within your space. Hmm. You want to understand what the emerging wishes are, what the what the strengths of your competitors are, what their weaknesses are. All of that stuff can play into your, your product strategy. Hmm. And you can do that? You pull in other product reviews from other um, well, competitors? Absolutely. So we our tool will... Um, Is will, that more the Ecom Spy tool? or which? No, that, we can do that within Feedback 5. You can't. Okay. Absolutely. So, so you can. It's very easy to add your own products. That's kind of almost automated if you want to do that. But if if you've identified other target products that you feel like you want to watch reviews on, it's very easy to do, and, and you can add it. We have some people using it too that are not really sellers. They maybe sell they sell to Amazon, but they don't sell on Amazon. That are using our tool as well for product reviews. Hmm. And um, there are a lot of brands too that are are you know, watching reviews, but they're also, you know, they don't know where a new brand, I mean, new brands can pop up out of nowhere um, and challenge even sometimes very big brands on Amazon. And, um, and so sometimes you don't know where this brand is going to go. And watching product reviews is one way that they can kind of have a little advanced warning system if something is coming up that they need to be aware of. Um, Jay, what's some, some ways people use, let's say, let's talk about, since we're talking about feedback five, feedback five that you never expected. Like that wasn't was intended for, but people, you know, marketers are um, creative. What are some ways that they use it that you would not have expected? Right. Well, um, I that, can that are legal, think, of course. I, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm going to be careful what I say here. Okay. But but the truth is, we 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 actually we've always been. You, you're 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 thinking what I'm. You're saying what I'm thinking. <laughs> so people do all kinds of things, especially even before the campaigns. And I probably shouldn't even talk about this because we we really don't we really try to take a fairly conservative view. We don't we don't lecture people excessively, but we, we try to keep people out of trouble. Yeah. I mean, like if someone on, like an example, like someone sending daily emails or something. What's an example of someone that's abusing the system? I guess. Uh, well, I mean, we've had people that have done cross marketing. Um, on there. So for example, you could, you, you could develop a system where you're, you're automatically blipping up, um, pictures of related products. I mean, there are things you can do. <laughs> so there are things you could do, which clearly that's a clear violation, right? Uh, you've had people that have designed uh, fairly interesting and, and complex, you know, um, invoices, um, that could be sent. Um, invoices, what do you mean? Well, things that look like an invoice. Um, that would come back. So you could have something that kind of looks like an invoice. Um, just so they open it, you mean? Or is that... No, just a, just kind of a professional touch. Um, uh, it comes back to the, to the, to the customer. Um, you know, there are all kinds of... There have been some very, very creative templates that people have created uh, that have just, you know, obviously very surprising and stunning and creative um, that, that people that people have used. Um, obviously there are things that, that push the envelope. You know, one thing that we were very concerned about early on was, was triggering emails. We do it, we allow it, but we're concerned about it. You know, you can trigger emails based on delivery. So, so you can, we can say, look, I want to send an email on, on delivery. And Amazon has not really, um, not really been concerned about it. Um, and we want to keep it that way. Um, certainly it can be useful to, to time very much. We allow for timing by day. We allow for timing by hour yeah. of the emails that are sent. Um, but, but we, we always want to be cautious because early on, you know, early days of seller central, when we first started getting involved, you, well, actually that's not true. It was, it was prohibited even then. At, at one point, Amazon prohibited sending of two types of emails, confirmation email, and delivery email. Hmm, why? So by confirmation email was yeah. early on Amazon, sellers could send, thanks for the order. I've got it, and I'm going to be processing it and shipping it soon. That's a confirmation email. A delivery inf- email is, your item is out for delivery, and here's the tracking number, right? That's a delivery email. Both of those, both of those types of emails, 
Amazon decided, and I don't know the year, but it was you know 10 years ago plus, they decided we're going to send those emails. That's our job. It's not the seller's job. And so they explicitly wrote into their seller agreements, you agree not to send order acknowledgement emails or delivery emails. So that that's not a new rule. That's a very old rule. And so we've always been a little concerned about putting too much emphasis on delivery time mm. as there is this tendency out there for people to say, your thing shipped. Here's the tracking number. You're going to be getting it soon. And that technically, mm. if you're, you know, not, not care, not careful enough, you're going to, you're going to kind of rub up against that Amazon rule. Mm. Now, if it's a feedback solicitation email, that's okay. If you happen to say, if all, if it's mainly about feedback and you happen to say, here's your tracking number, or we know that you just got it. Can you, you know, let us know how you felt about the service. That's all fine. Mm. But if the focus is on the delivery, then I think Amazon is asking and has asked ever since we've been in this business not to send those emails. And so that's one area where it gets a little dicey. You that's know, interesting. Try, yeah. Because of people, because you could time it, you know, you could time it for after to basically get the feedback on the product, but people could use it for another way, which is not allowed by Amazon. Like if they, if it gets sent and it gets received before, or they're talking even more about the delivery of it than the, the product feedback yeah. that wouldn't be allowed in the terms. Yeah. I think the core thing is it needs to be a feedback email and not a delivery email. And so if it's, if it's customer service, that aspect of the customer service, Amazon says, we reserve that to ourselves. We reserve that, that your item has shipped communication to ourselves. Yeah. The feedback is something that Amazon is happy to allow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really, really, they're not only happy to allow it, they really want it because they really want to encourage that personal connection between right. the seller and the buyer because they want to create a wow experience for the buyer. Yeah. Jay, there's two questions I have, and, and um, obviously um, they can be answered generally. Um, the one I want to talk about the product reviews, and two the campaign management, because those are both very important things. And obviously, people can use feedback five. They can do it, you know, if they have it just on their site, they can do it manually. Um, so I want to talk kind of generally of some things that would help people. Um, one on the product review side, right? Um, are there any specific ways or what are some of the ways you've seen a good tactics for trying to reverse a negative review or, um, you know, in a persuasion sort of way, what's worked with what you've seen? Cause I'm sure through your system, people have tried probably pretty <laughs> much everything to, to do that. Yeah. There, there are ways you can automate responses and things, uh, to a, to a negative product review for sure. So product reviews are a little different from from feedback reviews. Yeah. And so Amazon is a little more lenient when it comes to seller feedback about asking for removal. In fact, yeah. from day one, they have not only allowed it, but in some sense they have encouraged you to ask for removal once you have addressed the issue. Not as a coercion or quid, quid pro quo, but, but once you've asked – Product reviews are a little different, and if anything, Amazon is becoming more cautious about product reviews because of all the press that we all know about. Um, and so, and of course, the huge policy changes that have taken place uh, on product reviews right. in this past year. So there, you're not really allowed to go out and ask or cohere really in any way they want you to leave it alone they want that product review to be as pristine and neutral as possible and so and so i would say that best practices are to listen and hear what you what the product review is right if the customer is upset because box is damaged or they don't understand how this thing works or whatever, if there's anything you can do to reach out to the customer and make them happy with their Amazon experience, do it, right? <laughs> do it. Now, um, to what extent you can ask them to correct the record or whatever, I think that's a, a very fine line. If obviously yeah. they've said something that's clearly false and you make yeah. it clear to them, I think it's pretty obvious that it would be nice to, for them to correct the record. 
Um, but obviously, Amazon does not want anyone to be coerced in that mm -hmm. regard. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I know that really doesn't answer your question <laughs> fully, but it's probably the best I can tell you. Yeah. Although I will say this, I, of course, uh, the second thing you can do, obviously, which we mentioned earlier, is you can actually respond online. So if somebody says, you know, this thing, you know, doesn't do this, and you write back it, well, if you if you actually touch that red button on the bottom, it, it will do that, and no problem, and you'll be all set. That's a good practice to do. Not to complain against your reviewer, but to be helpful. Um, I would say I would say that's a, a good thing to yeah. do. Another thing which may be a little surprising uh, to some of your your readers that are always very focused on negative product reviews. We do have some some users that are also focused on positive reviews. They want to know they want to know what's positive about it. But interestingly enough, we had someone tell us recently that they're not only want they're happy when they get positive reviews. Don't get me wrong, but they are concerned that it may be positive for the wrong reason. Hmm. Like what? Well, they're like, in this cares? case, no, well well, I, without saying who it was, in this case, it was it was a I want to say it's a, not quite a medical product, but it was a, a nutrition related product. Okay, and so it's possible that that someone can write a positive review, but in an example could provide dosage information or or usage information which might not be recommended. Right, <laughs> and so they are concerned to number one make sure there's correct information out in the marketplace. So we want to make sure that nobody's writing something on Amazon that's going to be misconstrued. Oh, I'm going to take three of these a day when I should take one or whatever it may be. Right. Number one, even though it may be better for them <laughs> to use more than they should. But also there's a liability issue as well. So they kind of feel like we need to monitor this because if people are egregiously writing things that are bad or even potentially dangerous about consuming this product and and we don't actually step in and correct the record, we may be on the hook. And so that's the example. Yeah. That, that's the best example I have, but I'm sure there are others as well. The And on the campaign management side of things, mm -hmm. what are some, because again, this, this goes into different skills of frequency. When do you send it? How many do you send? What's best practices for that? If someone's starting, they go, okay, I want to start sending emails. How many and what frequency? Like you mentioned, the delivery is great. Do you send it one day after delivery? Do you send it a week after delivery? Do you send three more follow-up? What What do you recommend as best practice uh, for the optimal result for the business and for the customer? Yeah. So there are certain general principles, right? Obviously, you, you ask once, you ask very politely, you start your message by saying, you know, checking to make sure you're satisfied, you know, um, and really making it a very customer service centric email and offering to address a problem if there is any, you know, capture that negative feedback before it happens and, and then ask for the feedback. Um, so those are best practices. Um, you know, obviously you want to send it, you know, FBA versus non-FBA. Your timing may be different. Your style may be different um, depending on, on, on the circumstance. Um, so how often? Yeah. You know, it's generally safe to ask twice for feedback, generally. Some people don't want to do it. It's okay. You know, everybody's situation is different. You ask once. Obviously, you know, we monitor for feedback, positive and negative. So if anything does pop up, we don't solicit again. Um, we also have lots of auto exclusions because, you know, you may ask once, but the person may have contacted you by email. There may be some other other factor, which is a which is a, a trigger to not solicit. So we've got a lot of very, very deep um, exclude capabilities to not solicit when you don't want to. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of custom situations where people have custom products and custom brands where it. It can be, it can be reasonable to send more touch points, even more than two. And I say that cautiously. It's a unique situation. Sometimes you have one for feedback, one for product review. Um, there are reasons, and it really, it really is part of it. Is the kind of person you know, everything you're selling has a certain niche. Can can have a niche. You know, if it's a certain person is really into, you know, I'll just make something up. I mean, let's say you're selling a. Um, a, uh, uh, 
an electronic product that is kind of really niche and people are really into talking about it. Or let's say it's a, it's a knitting product and everybody who buys a, knit, a knitting product like this is really into this type of knitting or whatever. You know, people, sometimes if you know your people like to converse about the product and about how they're using it, you're okay. If it's more like, I just want to buy it and forget it type Amazon purchase, you know, use your judgment. Uh, maybe fewer touch points are wiser there. Mm -hmm. So is a general rule people should probably send two in general, one after delivery, maybe one later on? Our, our default when we first started is one. We allow two. Um, I would say do one. If you're just if you're just a large seller selling all kinds of different things, yeah. do one um, and see how that goes, and then try to and measure and observe, and that's what we recommend. Mm -hmm. I would say that most people who do two, I'm going to be careful here. <laughs> most people who do do two do get a better response rate, but mm -hmm. there's some people that are that are more conservative and don't wish to do it. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. And is there a timing? That's best. So there are two timing questions. There's time of day and there is, um, mm -hmm. there is uh, a, uh, a time after delivery yeah. or time after order. Um, and there's also um, obviously um, issues about, uh, about location, um, you know, state, country whatever so all of these things could be parameters so i this is an area where we may be coming out with some some stats at some point on open mm. rates at different times mm. open rates on different days of the week um uh those are the two easy things to measure mm. you know open rates mm. and you can segment by open rates and so so but then you also have got other variables you've got You've got obviously the other big variable is what, what is your subject line. Um, so we it is true we do have a lot of data on that. Um, I um, not sure exactly that I can give you any hard and fast rules. Yeah. Any good uh, subject but, lines people should be using? Now you like uh, you've become a copywriter expert because you've seen all these emails go. Yeah, out. we do have some recommendations on that. I I don't want to since I am not I do know our guys have studied this and I do know we do have some some very specific opinions about this um but i'd be reluctant to say it here because i'm not sure how scientific it is well i'm only talking to you so it's your opinion um yeah it's anecdotal yeah. a little well, bit it is so, true yeah. that some subject lines are better and yeah. you know putting a name now we're experimenting with emojis and subject lines um mm -hmm. i don't know exactly what the final word is on emojis but they're always looking at these things and studying them and um Names, emojis, asking a question. There are different things that you can do. But I can also tell you that what works in 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 2012 may not have the same effect in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, the, the subject lines that will uh, induce someone to open. What have you seen with trends, Jay, with time of day or day of the week that works best? <laughs> I I don't have it in front of me the data and so I'm going to I'm going to pass on that. However, I will go back to the team and have them I will chat with you afterwards. I'll okay. be happy to do that. So I mean is, does anything stick out to you like more morning or afternoon? It doesn't have to be like 6:53 or something, but does anything stick out to you that was more morning or afternoon or early morning any like general time of the day that tend to be better than others? Yeah. So what I'm going to tell you, you're going to think is a cop out, and, and it is a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, it depends. Okay. And it really does depend. That's because, okay. Yeah. Tell me what. Because because it is true that an individual seller can experiment with a different time and get a different result, or they can choose to opt out. Some people want to opt. Well, there are different reasons people want to opt out over the weekends. Don't don't send over weekends. Hold those up and send them on Monday. Um. You know. Different people selling in different niches experience, experience can experience different results, mm -hmm. and so, and so because of that, I, I don't know exactly. I don't have a bright line rule to give you. Mm -hmm. um, I do know I've heard, anecdotally, um, different, 
you know, very different opinions about soliciting on weekends versus soliciting on a regular day. Um, but it's a very good question. And, um, and I, on another you interview, people argue about that. People, some people say weekends are good. Some people don't. Well, not only do they argue about it, but even more than that, they actually have, they actually have data that shows that the results are, are different. Yeah. So what drives, what's the causality that drives those differences? Uh, that's, where it gets more interesting. And it's the same like health, like it's that both health products or both like both the same genre. I think it's, it's in the same genre. You're typically, I, I, my view is when you get significant differences in behavior, you're dealing with a different customer. Element right. Different right. Genre. That, that would be my hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could see that. Um, yeah. So I want to go back to what's interesting is you started this with just two of you, right? So I want to talk about the team team part because you've built a team at this point. Um, and that's also interesting because when you do the larger contract work, does the team have to expand and contract depending on the contract work? Now it's probably more of a steady, uh, steady yeah, team. Yeah, we've, we've always been we've, – we've had organic growth. We haven't really had to contract for lack of business. Mm -hmm. uh, Fortunately, um, so we did. You know, we started out very small, um, one developer. Then we had a. How did you developers. find that developer? Because you yourself, well, just somebody I met. We started working together. Okay. You know? <laughs> so, and uh, then from there, you get a little more systematic about it. <laughs> but we had a, yeah. We then we had two developers, and and then we had, uh, um, we had a graphic designer uh, early on, and you know, we've had a little bit of in and out but for the most part we've had some of the core people early on are, are still here um some of the early people on that were with feedback five are still here so that's great and then talk about the timeline so we talked about feedback five was the first product what came after that well really smart price really existed before feedback five hmm. but we had the term smart price but we never really, we've still never really satisfied smart price. We have people who use mm. it. They love it. It's a very customized pricing model mm. that we've done for people, but we really don't market it um, at all. Um, so, so Feedback 5 was our first major tool. Um, and, and then Restock Pro would be our other major tool. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Ecom Spy is an important tool. Um, it's, it's not, we don't sell that on a subscription model. We sell that on a. You know, you can come and use as much of it as you want. You can use it for free to start out. If you like it, you can just buy credits and use it. So, Ecom Spy, you're saying? Ecom Spy. We have some people that buy, you know, a billion credits, and I'm exaggerating slightly, and spend a whole year or two using them, and other people that buy them every few months when they need them. So, what do people use the Ecom Spy for that's been valuable? So, I don't really know all the ways people use it. <laughs> Because people use it in ways that I've heard people use it in ways that we never anticipated they would use it. Yeah, of, like what? You know, market monitoring and checking out what's going on. But really, its real initial idea behind it is is that people are looking at opportunities um, in the market. They're looking at bulk opportunities. They're looking for those needles, hopefully not just a needle, but needles in a haystack to to, to get into the game. And so, so our view was is that you know, a lot of Amazon sellers are going to be data savvy and really what they're after, whether they're doing an opportunity buy of a, of a certain number of goods or whether they're working with a new wholesaler or whatever, we're assuming that they can get a spreadsheet and from, from whatever it is that they're buying from. And that spreadsheet's going to have um, UPC codes or EANs and, or maybe even ASIN sometimes. <laughs> but, um, and that they want to have, whether it's 100 items or whether it's 10,000 items that they're trying to evaluate, they want to understand, is it, number one, worth working with a supplier? Um, and number two, if it is worth working with a supplier as an Amazon seller, you know, what do I want to concentrate on? What area of his products do I want to concentrate on? And so the idea is you can load this data up. We can give you a temperature of the market. Um, at that time, exactly what your profitability would look like selling these products, um, and it's just a it's just a very fast evaluation tool to understand whether you want to take it, take up take up an opportunity with supplier or you know what 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 products you want to focus on. It doesn't it's not magic. You still need to exercise judgment, but it allows you to to get a lot of data very very rapidly to make an informed judgment on a on a large catalog. Yeah. Um, so it's 
very simple idea, um, but also very powerful for those that need this type of tool. Jake, so another question um, about pricing. So it seems like the Ecom SPY pricing model is different from Feedback 5, which is your traditional SaaS. How do you decide on the pricing model and then the actual price? So... <laughs> Um, so really we just, for Ecom Spy, we just thought, well, this is something that, that we're going to start it out. We're going to, going to price it on a per trial per unit basis. It's going to be simple. People won't feel like they're locked in. They can buy as much as they want. That's just what we started because we were trying it and we've never changed it. So we could add, we could very well add a subscription model onto that that gives you a, a more of a certain number of hits. Um, not sure that that decision still still something we could do down the line um, in terms of pricing you know we try to we try to develop a rough sense you know early on there was yeah. you know we didn't know a lot about pricing we just tried to see you know what is fair what do we think we can do to right. in order to make ends meet and still keep keep the keep growing the product so we made educated judgments um, uh, based on all the things we knew about the market about the product about the costs um, you know nowadays in SaaS world, there's just lots of fancy models and people out there that are software pricing experts and all of that. I, I, I can't say that we're experts in that. Um, th no, I just asked that because, like you, we were talking before, one person goes, oh, my God, you're only selling this for $20? Yeah. And I would pay 150 And then the other person's it, like, this is way too expensive. So you, you have to sure. go, you have to price it somewhere. Sure. So what's your, sure. And, and, your method? And, and, yeah, and 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 what what every business does, whether you're you know it's a pharmaceutical company or whether it's uh, uh, whether it's a software company, whether you're buying Salesforce or whatever, there's always market differentiation, you know. And how do you differentiate? Some people can only afford this much, some people can afford a lot more. Um, so you 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 know you you allocate, um, you know you allocate capabilities and you scale your mm. price of the product, whether it's right. based on you know, volume or sales amounts or capacity utilization, you come up with something that's fair and also features. You can, you can add more features at higher levels. So you come up with something that's fair yeah. and that allows the people that, that are going to get more value out of it and that can get more value out of it. Um, you give them more value and, and you charge more and those that don't need as much value and can't afford it, you charge less and mm -hmm. it's never perfect. And that's, that's the way it happens with a lot of software these days. You'll, you'll see a pricing menu, and you'll see it scales one way or the other. And, you know, we're no different. And, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people have come in, you know, I don't say a lot, but several people, as you well know, have come into the market after us offering feedback management tools. Um, and we've always, you know, looked at, you know, always looked at their pricing models. Now it's a little different, but... Many people just replicated our pricing model very mm. closely. <laughs> they just looked at it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe they did their own study and decided that was the right one, or maybe they just looked at looked at ours and said, "We're just going to cop." They've been <laughs> doing it for a while. It's working. We might as well just do it. So we haven't changed it a lot, but it, it, we are very excited. We actually, um, our team has been working on a actually a new pricing model um, that's going to be pretty exciting for uh, for which one for feedback five. Okay. So it's going to be coming out, oh, really in a few weeks. Um, I don't think anybody's going to be forced into it, but I think a lot of people will want to do it. And so one of the things that it's really going to be focused on and optimizing on is we, we're seeing more and more sellers that have multiple marketplaces, whether it's in Europe or, or maybe whatever. On Amazon. So on like, Amazon. Not just like we're not talking Amazon to Walmart to eBay. It's more Amazon Canada, Mul Amazon. Mexico. Multiple Amazon marketplaces gotcha. and, and multiple stores or whatever. And so one of the things we're doing is we're going to make it very, very easy and, and, and cost effective to be able to manage to number one, to manage multiple stores. Um, so you'll be able to manage multiple stores on Amazon with a single, you know, essentially a single a feedback five account. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty excited about that. And uh, um, that's going to be, you know, coming out here pretty soon. Yeah. I always ask Jay, you know, since the Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment in the business and what's been a proud, one of the proudest moments? Hmm. That's a good question. So. You know, I mentioned I mentioned a few times early on where we were doing custom projects, um, and that we we had people that that 
couldn't pay, didn't pay. Um, you know, I mentioned that case of where somebody, you know, filed bankruptcy and these were really nice people and we were really bummed because they really had negotiated with us very hard to deliver value for them and hold off on the payment. Mm. And that was, that was a, a, a pain point for us. And it was also a pain point because there were times where, you know, we're doing work and we're, we're, we're doing some custom work, but also investing in platforms where, you know, things were, the money's you know, not coming in and it's going out. Type of thing. Let's put yeah. it that way. Yeah. You need to pay salaries and you need to watch cash flow. I wouldn't call it a, a terribly low moment, but but there were times where there's uncertainty. Yeah. And you realize that, you know, this is either going to work or it's not. And if it doesn't work, um, you're going to pivot, you're going to do something else, or you're going to have to contract. <laughs> you know, right. you don't want to contract. No entrepreneur does. But they realize, all, all entrepreneurs realize that if you're going to take a risk, uh, it may or may not work. Even even the most yeah. cautious, uh, careful plans, you've got to take risks, and and you hope it's going to work, and you build all your, your risk, um, you know, uh, management into it. But not everything works perfectly. Do you yeah. pivot? Do you do something else, or or what? So there's certainly, and, and of course, we still have that today. We, we've got lots of fun, fun, and we think very valuable projects that we're working on that we can deliver value into the market. But are we certain that people will – is it certain that that value is going to be delivered? Are we certain people are going to pay for it? Are we certain that somebody else is not planning on doing the same thing exactly when we are? No, we're not certain. So. Yeah. So on the flip side, the one of the proudest moments. Hmm. Well, in some ways, getting that offer for the contract was a proud moment. Even though we didn't take it, it was a proud moment. It was a nice validation. Amazon had recommended us. We did work. We got huge kudos from this large company that said, you guys made a major difference in us getting this billion-dollar contract. I mean, I know it wasn't all us, but, but they said some very nice things about us, and we really appreciated hearing that. So that was a proud moment even though we had to say no. And the fact that we said no was also a proud moment because mm. it was a tough call and we were proud that we made it and, and didn't get sucked into something that we weren't mm. really destined to do. Yeah. So so there have been other proud moments. Um, obviously, we've meet, met certain milestones. We're kind of celebrating our yeah. 10th anniversary. Congratulations, yeah. We've you know published a milestone where uh, you know, something like 45 million positive feedbacks that we've we've helped get wow. um, we're very very proud of some of those milestones um but you know those are some of the big ones yeah i love it um jay i want to point people towards your your site and i have um a last question for you i really appreciate your time on this we sh people can go to a few places i believe ecomengine.com it's e c o m engine.com they can go to feedback five Dot com. Where else can we point people towards they can discover and explore your, your tools? Yeah, thanks. So ecomengine.com, feedback5.com, spelled out five. Of course, it should work either way. Um, Restock Pro, R-E-S-T-O-C-K, Pro, P-R-O.com, restockpro.com, um, and ecomspy, E-C-O-M-S-P-Y.com. Those are our main websites. Um, maybe more to come, um, but, uh, you know, all of those can be found on ecomengine.com. So yeah. definitely appreciate us checking us out. And we're a very open book company. So uh, we, we, we really enjoy feedback, uh, whether it's, it's glowing feedback, of course, we love. Uh, but we love, <laughs> almost, right. we, we love almost as much, um, you know, feedback that, that's constructive as well. Yeah. And uh, so. So last question, I actually have two questions. One is, um, you know, obviously we talked about the Feedback 5 Ecom, uh, you know, the Ecom Spy, Restock Pro, and Smart Price. Um, I'm curious what other softwares you recommend other people, obviously, that you don't feel the, the need for. What else out there do you recommend to, to sellers to complement what you do? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, um, we don't personally get into the business of, of recommending a lot of software. We do have certain software partners that are on our website hmm. and some coaches and things that are on our website. But, you know, there's some really great shipping software out there that helps people do shipping. You know, I mentioned ShipStation earlier. That That's a good product. Um, there are a lot of um, very solid ERP products out there. Um, these are, you know, some friends of ours. I don't necessarily need to mention any of them, but... 
there are some really good ERP products that, that are multi-market channel, um, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I hate to mention some and then exclude others because there are a number of them. There are a number You're of them that diplomatic. are diplomatic. I, I, I know, maybe, <laughs> maybe to a fault. Uh, there, there are some really good ones out there, and there's some good people um, yeah. that that are really passionate about about the marketplace and that produce really good products. They are. There's some strengths. Uh, some of them have strengths. Um, some are better than others. Um, so I'd say, you know, ERP tools, um, shipping tools are very important. Um, and, of course, there's some good research tools. We're not the only research game in town. There's some research tools that, that will, you know, extrapolate um, based on sales rank and things and show you what, the, what sales, sales is and, you know, keyword tools and things like that that are out there that are, are an important component of a, of a good Amazon ecosystem. Is there a place you so, go to see, to learn or subscribe to, to kind of get whatever's out on the market, cutting edge tools or information in the e-commerce world? Where do you, where do you read? So our, our job is really all day, every day. I mean, not just my job, but our product team's job. They're supposed to really understand the market. They're supposed to understand what people are getting value out of. So yeah, we, we obviously we internet retailer, e-commerce bites, you name it, we, we, we keep up with a lot of blogs too. We have a lot of good partners um, that are coaches or that are, you know, gurus and experts in the Amazon marketplace. We obviously read them and, and with some reluctance, I will say that we, we do sometimes learn things from some of our competitors as well. We, we read their, we'll read their blogs and we'll learn something. Um, we, we try to learn wherever we can and, and try to stay really up to speed on the market um, and understand what's going on because really – Really, Amazon is a it's a great market. It's an exciting market. It's it's a global market and it is fast moving. Yeah. So what is true today uh, will you got to keep your finger on the pulse. Probably be true next year to a large extent. But there are Mm. other things that are going on. And so you can't just learn it once and be done. Yeah. Um, Conferences that you like. Obviously, you're going to Prosper Show. What other Prosper, conferences? Prosper, we go to SCOE, we go to Ecom Chicago, we've gone to uh, uh, Jim Cockrum's conference. Um, you know, those are, and we've probably been to a few other. We, of course, we've uh, we, we've been to um, Ed's conference in in New York, um, small seller conference. Um, so those are some of the ones we've gone to. You know, we. We, we, we discuss among ourselves. I'd love to hear your advice. Uh, should we be going to more conferences? Because uh, we are, we, like I said earlier, we never did Do you go to IRCE out. also? Uh, we'll be going there this year. Whether we display or not, I don't know, but we'll definitely be yeah. there. How do you should. determine whether you're going to display or just attend? Um, uh, we just talk about it. I can't yeah. say that we have any scientific yeah. reason. I don't know and if there's like more Amazon sellers, you know, because IRC probably is. IRC traditionally has been more, much more broad based. Very right. few Amazon sellers. Exactly. Last few years, a little different. You've had pre shows that are Amazon centric. Things may be changing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Amazon is so big now that can't you can't it. you can't not know about them. Right. So last question, Jay. Um, culture. What do you do to maintain culture? I'm talking to one of your staff, and she was very big on you getting the word out about Ecom Engine and just you talking because she said, we have a great guy at the helm of this company. So you're doing something to foster a really good culture and uh, people who love the company itself. And so I'm curious what you do uh, for the team to maintain that. That's a good question. Um, well, I don't, I'm not sure you're talking about, but that, that's nice that, that, that this staff member said that. <laughs> and, uh, so really, really, you know, you talk to any entrepreneur that's gotten a business to a certain point and, uh, you know, what's the, what's the famous quote, um, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, and, and there is a, there's an element of truth to that. Certainly you need to have a good market. Um, certainly you need to have a good strategy, um, but you can have all those things. Um, and if you don't have folks that are excited and really rowing the boat all in, all in the right direction and, and really caring about customers and caring and loving what they do, um, you're not going to get as much done. And so, Mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, 
it, it, it's good to be passionate about your job and it's good to enjoy your job. Yeah. And uh, why, why would you want to, why would you want to do it if you weren't, weren't, I mean, obviously you yeah. need to eat, but why would you, you need to have that passion right. too. So we really, it's important to us that we, we really work well together. And yeah. so we try to build a team where everybody's views are honored, uh, where we have good communication, where we really, you know, we're trying to empower sellers. Um, that's our mission, really, to empower sellers with great software. But in, in, it sounds cliche-ish, but we really also want to empower our staff, um, each and every one of them, uh, to be the best they can do at what they do and to really um, think about their individual job, but not just about their job. Think about the customer because that's our value stream, what we're delivering to our customers. So everybody is empowered to think about the big picture of what we're doing for our customer and, and to step up to the plate. If, if. What do you do to foster that? Like, do you do, I'm just curious, some like tactical things. Like, do you do, okay, we do a meeting every Tuesday and Thursday or something that gets the communication or, or yeah. I don't know, you do a company outing or I don't know, what are some of the tactical cool. things? Yeah, we, we definitely do? do that. We definitely have company outings and dinners and, and things like that. But, you know, we have a meeting cadence at our company. Um, we have you know, weekly meeting cadences for different groups of the company. We have a monthly um, all company meeting cadence where we announce certain things and have updates and take Q and A and honor people for for great accomplishments that they've done in the company. Um, those are some of the things we do. We we you know we 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 share in in the success of the company. I think fairly fairly openly and, and generously, and I think people appreciate that. Um, and um, you know, those are some of the things we do. And but really, a lot of it is is really attitude and and whether or not it goes back to that empowerment question. And when we tell people, you know, we really want you to not just view your job in a tunnel, but really think about the big picture. And you're at the table um, on decisions that are being made. I think that I think that empowers people. And I think it it ultimately uh yeah. Leads to more more engaged um, more engaged uh, employees that that again are more passionate about doing right by the customer. Yeah, you're bringing the process to them, so they're invested in the process, and that's what you did. Sound like you did all along, even from that big contract, you know, in the beginning. That's exactly right. Yeah, so, yeah. Jay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Everyone should check out ecomengine.com. All their products, all their information's on there, and uh, thank you again. Yeah, great talking with yeah. you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred.